Okay, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Aaron Held, who is currently a postdoc at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Aaron completed his PhD at the University of Heidelberg and then did postdocs at Imperial, Vienna University, and Princeton before moving to Paris. He has worked on various aspects of asymptotically safe gravity, black holes, and more general phenomenology. And today he will tell us about numerical relativity in effective field theories of gravity. Please. Yeah, thank you very much, Yasaman, for the kind introduction. Also, thank you very much for the invitation. So, um, as Yasaman said in the, in the, in the introduction, I, I come from high energy physics. So I'm very interested in, in sort of modifications that you would generically expect from quantum corrections or from more UV complete theories than um, general relativity plus the standard model. And one way to deal with um, a big class of these theories are um, effective field theories. So just parameterizing all possible deviations that you might expect and then trying to constrain them. And so I've worked a bunch on particle physics and trying to constrain the interactions that occur there. And now I'm I focused for quite some years on trying to work on black hole physics and gravitational phenomena that they relate to and trying to constrain the in that case then curvature deviations which occur there. And so this talk will be completely classical. I will not talk about any quantum aspects. There might be some motivations. I will not touch them. Feel free to ask if, you, if you're interested in anything in between. But the talk will be completely classical. And from that perspective, it might also be useful for people not thinking about high energy physics at all, for people thinking about cosmology, for people thinking about just um, probing general relativity in the strong field regime. Um, then also let me, I'm not quite sure um, what the background of, of all of you in the audience is, so feel free to jump in with questions whenever I say uh, any term which is unclear. I try to be um, very um, basic and always start um, from the very beginning when I talk about things, but I might, I might just have missed that something is not obvious. Yeah, so jump in with questions. I, I can see some of you um, on the corner there. Um, but if not, just just unmute and and we can. Yes, we will we will interrupt. Don't worry. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So the plan um, that I want to talk about is I want to first say what I specifically mean by effective field theories, and indeed I think there's a little more subtlety in that um, what one even means by setting up an effective field theory. So I'll go a little bit through that, and then what I want to achieve is I want to convince you that we are now in a very good position of producing these very nice um, gravitational waveforms, which are, of course, absolutely crucial if we want to compare with observation, because that, that's the state of the art that you can do in general relativity, right? Produce a full waveform all the way from the in spiral of two black holes um, through the merger, which is this, this peak regime here, and then what is called the ring down phase and the very end of the gravitational wave signal. All these three regimes we would like to describe in one waveform and then do so-called matched filtering where basically a theoretical waveform is just scanned through the data and whenever you have a statistical significance, you, you pick up an event. And so if you want to detect deviations from general relativity, the sort of most constraining thing that you can do is try to have these waveforms for the deviations that you would expect. And what I want to convince you of is that it's not totally crazy to do that for these effective field theory corrections. So I'll try to convince you that the mathematical equations that we write down are well posed. This is very, very important if you want to put the um, equations on a computer and simulate in the strong field regime. It's basic. Without that, I think it's basically hopeless. Um, and it, it might also be more generally important in a sense of whether you can even make sense of a time evolution in the theory. So there's, there's some fundamental interest in there as well. And then I'll talk about the actual implementation on the computer with the example of the, the first corrections that you would expect. And um, you will see during the talk that these theories will contain so-called Ostrogratsky ghosts. So they will be higher derivative theories. 
um, which are generally expected to cause instabilities. And I will, I will have some bonus material on potential ways of, of curing these instabilities, or at least m making them less severe. All right, so let's um, get started with gravitational effective field theories. So um, effective field theory is really a framework that people apply throughout um, all different sorts of physics, and presumably many of you have come across a given effective field theory. And even like when you talk about effective field theory of um, binary mergers, there's different effective field theories which can be which which are meant by this. Here I really mean a fundamental effective field theory of the metric. So my my D, my field content will be mostly just the metric, although there's some subtlety because there can be higher modes um, in the in the curvature scalars, and I'll come to that in a second. Then I should specify the symmetries that I have. Um, and by the way, I always say IR, which just means at the energy scales at which you observe. Um, the symmetries will just be the usual Lorentz invariance, and I will not touch that. I will not talk about Lorentz violating theories. And then finally, you have to set up some expansion scheme. So you have to say, well, what is the scale in which you expand your effective field theory? And in my case, it will be curvature will be the goal, but you will see that all the expansions will be in a mixture of curved derivatives and curvature. And I think it's, it's an interesting future task to sort of disentangle these two expansions and set up an effective field theory which distinguishes between an expansion in derivatives and an expansion in curvature. But here we, we will not do that today. And so this is useful because within the regime of validity, so if you're diligent about whenever you extract observational consequences, testing that these observational consequences are within the basically regime of convergence of, of, this, of this effective field theory, and then assuming um, that all the couplings in your effective field theory are natural in the sense of that they are order one couplings, all the dimensionless couplings, then this is supposed to capture all the known possible physics that can occur, like or at least the onset of all these known physics that can occur. And since we're interested in searching for deviations, small deviations around general relativity, in that case, this is a very good framework. And I think this is very nice because you might have seen these, these plots of all possible things that you can do in, in modified gravity. Um, and this, in some sense, introduces strict rules. You still have to specify your field content and your symmetries, but then it introduces rules of how how you expect modifications of gravity to enter. So, so you that's mentioned yeah. diffeomorphism invariance in in there. Oh yeah, that that uh, that's the, what I, I mean. That also with Lorentz invariance. So I will not touch diffeomorphism invariance as well. And indeed, I mean, of course, I will foliate. So I will my foliation will will formally break part of the diffeo group. But the foliation is is as arbitrary in that sense. Yeah, it's just picking a gauge. All right, so if I want to do that for curvature, um, so I'm, what, I want, what I will do now is I will just count in each um, operator that I can write down, I will count the dimensionality of that operator, which is a combination of curvature and derivatives occurring. So that, that is just because each curvature here, in this case, uh, the Ricci scalar, comes of course with two derivatives, right? So you can have you can have two derivatives of the metric. So this already has dimension two, and then you can have external derivatives acting on the curvature scalar as well. And so parametrizing, accounting, just expanding all possible terms in in this effective field theory in this way, you start at at order one in curvature, and you just write down the Einstein-Hilbert term. That's just general relativity. The zeroth order term would be the cosmological constant, and I will not, not touch it in this talk. Um, then at second order, you can write down two more terms, um, which are a combination of the Ricci tensor and the square of the Ricci scalar. So you will see now that these are order two in curvature. These couplings are dimensionless by themselves. This one is not. 
And um, of course you can go on, but before that, so why have I not written something like um, the Riemann tensor squared or the Weyl tensor squared? That's because I, at each order, I will try to reduce with all the possible um, symmetries that I have, index symmetries, geometric identities, and also specific identities due to four dimensions. So I will, everything will be in four dimensions. In this case, I've actually used the Gauss-Bonnet identity to rewrite the Riemann squared terms into um, Ricci squared terms. And there's actually nice algebra, algebra tools which basically do that for you. And this has been very well checked in many, many papers. So if you proceed down the line and you do that for the cubic um, corrections, it starts to get more messy. So there, after applying all this reduction and, and all of this in vacuum gravity, so no external fields, um, after doing that, you can write down these, all of these terms, nine terms, and it starts to get very messy. Now you have actually the wild tensor being involved. You can't fully remove the wild tensor anymore. And at fourth order, it gets even more, even more complicated. And I'm not even writing down all terms. And then you can go on if you want to and go to arbitrarily high order. So there's one more thing that people do to simplify this, which is actually a very huge simplification, and that is so-called field redefinitions. So this is, this is the effective field theory expansion before field redefinitions. So what do I mean um, by a field redefinition? I mean that, for instance, you can take the metric and you can transform the metric and add to the metric, uh, again, a combination of the metric and some curvature scalar, which here in the X you can think of as the Ricci scalar, but you could also pick some other scalar. And you can also um, transform it with indices just being on the, on the tensorial quantity itself. So in this case, for instance, the Ricci tensor. And you can all immediately see that if you perform this transformation on this action, then you will generate these type of terms, right? Because the contraction here will be lifted into a contraction with this and with this, and it will exactly generate these terms with C1 and C2. So if I want to, I can now pick C1 and C2 such that they cancel these terms. And if I do that consistently, order by order in the effective field theory, I'm actually taking, you can actually remove a lot of terms, which should then be absent up to corrections of the next order. So if you do that in vacuum, so not, um, if you couple to, to external fields like a scalar field or the standard model, then it's more complicated because then you will change how these fields couple to the standard model and you will somehow change what you mean by a metric. So fields coupling to this metric will no longer be minimally coupled as they were in this, in this metric. But let's, for, for the purposes of this talk, I will stay in vacuum so you can perform these field redefinitions. And it is expected that at least whenever the global solution of your theory remains perturbatively close to a solution of lower order, these field redefinitions should be fine. Um, which is something that actually I think should be, should be confirmed, but yeah. So if you do that, then you can fully remove the quadratic terms. These would just be zero then. And then the first corrections come in at cubic order. And then in the quartic case, you can also of course have still corrections. So what's very nice about this is that now any deviation should be parameterized by just these sort of any onset of deviations should be parameterized by just one parameter and then if you want to be more precise you have to include two more parameters. So this is why I think it's very nice and interesting to to simulate these theories before and after field redefinition. And um, the key to making this work, you will see, is again making use of these field redefinitions and reintroducing some terms which are helpful for well posedness. And these are precisely the terms with the highest um, derivatives acting on a single metric. So these will be these terms here. 
And so I can also perform yet another field redefinition and just decide to reintroduce these terms. And this, as you will see in a bit, will be the, the key to making the equations well posed. Can I ask a quick question about the field redefinition there? Um, yes. I mean, you want the metric to be covariantly constant, uh, but if, if yes. capital X and capital X, I mean, if capital X is a, is a Ricci scalar that depends on position, then that doesn't look as though the new metric would be covariantly constant. No, I mean, that, that depends on the solution, right? And if you have a global solution, I think if this metric is covariantly cons conserved, this one will be as well on the specific solution. Oh, of course, only uh, like up order by order in the effective field theory. Okay. So That's... really, I, I think, so if you're not sticking to this strict order by order notion, then this field redefinition can change the physics. And you will see um, later on that it can remove certain modes in, in the theory. But um, if, if you want to only capture deviations, which are staying perturbatively close to the lower order solution in the first place, then um, the field redefinition should be fine. But in some sense, you can also just view all of this as just a motivation for looking at these terms. And you will see that actually the class of theories that you should be able to treat with the methods that I'm going to present is, is fairly generic. So if you don't like um, the field definitions, just view it as a way of sort of um, performing these simulations and understanding the strong field regime of modified theories of gravity. Yeah, I, I think Brian's comment is uh, is probably most relevant when you include any uh, stress energy tensor in there because that's right. The, the solutions to R, the equation of motion from R equals zero, they will be solutions also to the second one. So you will get away with it ever if I put in a, some stress energy. I suspect it will cause us very serious differences. Indeed, and and in whenever you put in stress energy, so for instance, if you were to want to consider mergers of neutron stars. I would expect the leading corrections to be of quadratic order because you cannot just remove them. If you start to perform these field definitions, you will change how the matter couples now non-minimally to the metric, and that will bring back the second order um, corrections that you get. So yes, very much only in vacuum. But where do you expect these second order ones would come from then? From non-minimal couplings? These, are, these are higher derivative in time. That's right. So how will that be generated? Well, you will have non-minimal couplings of the um, metric, uh, sorry, of the, of the matter content to the curvature, right? Yes, but I, 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 I'm not sure I would expect it to be of that form. But anyway, I listen to see where it so, so maybe the key, so I'm not claiming that the um, dynamical equations will look exactly the same before and after the field redefinitions. I'm claiming that the physics that you extract order by order will remain the same or in the regime of validity of the EFT. All right. So with that little preface of, of our motivation, you can see, I will introduce what I mean by well posedness And this really relies on, on two key um, steps that have been performed before. One is, of course, the well posedness in general relativity, which is due to Yvonne Choquet-Bruha. And then, uh, or at least she has completed the proof. Um, and then there's a very nice, and I think, um, underappreciated paper by David Noakes, already from the 80s, where he proves well posedness for the quadratic theory, which is the paper that sort of has gotten me interested in all of this. And we've recently extended um, this to the to the to arbitrarily higher order. So I will go through all these three points. I will try to summarize well posedness in general relativity. And I will do so in a way which is maybe a little bit different from as you've seen it before, which, which uses the concept of Lyrae weights. And the Lyrae weights will tell you which type of partial differential equations, which systems of partial differential equations 
can be diagonalized, or at least the principal part can be diagonalized. And if the principal part can be diagonalized, we have very strong math theorems that immediately tell us about um, local well positiveness. That works for general relativity, it works for quadratic gravity, and it then works also for cubic, quartic, and so on devi um, deviations if you perform the necessary field redefinitions, or alternatively, it works for classes of theories which have the right form. So let's um, first understand what I even mean by a well-posed initial value problem. Well, physically, what I mean is that we want to slice the space-time into a time evolution, right? So we perform an ADM decomposition into spatial slices and a time direction. And these will evolve. And of course, now the space-time curvature will lead to potential, um, this will not all be flat space-times. And this um, initial value evolution should is well posed if the solution exists for all future time and if it's unique and if it continuously depends on modifications of the initial data. Physically, to me, this really means that you can define a reasonable notion of time and time evolution in the theory. And this is what I would refer to as global well posedness or global hyperbolicity. And to me, really, that should be a criterion of useful classical theories. If you don't have global time, if you can prove or make a statement that you don't expect this thing to have global time evolution, I, I really don't know where to start to extract um, any observation from that theory, because it just means that at some time, time evolution ends. Um, now, I'm not going to claim anything about global hyperbolicity or global um, well posedness I'm only going to refer as to local well posedness which is the statement that at least for some small time you can these three things um, hold true that the solution exists for some time it's unique for some time and it continuously depends on the initial data and that local well posedness is very, very crucial for putting um, equations on a computer, because if you start discretizing and if you make the resolution smaller, if this, especially this last point is not fulfilled, then you will see that if you make the resolution smaller, your approximation becomes worse. So if you want to see convergence on a computer, this is an absolute must, at least for that, it's an absolute must. And that's also why it's been very, very crucial um, in, in performing binary simulations in general relativity. So as I already said, Yvonne choquet bruha was who recently, by the way, turned 100, um, had, has formally proven well-posedness already in 1952. And then it took, of course, the development of um, numerical methods and and picking the right gauge and also just having the sufficient supercomputer resources to be able to perform these simulations. And then there's a bunch of works, I think, which should be acknowledged in, in making the first binary simulations work. In particular, of course, Franz Pretorius's first binary merger in 2005. And that's all at the very heart of um, being able to perform these simulations in general relativity. So, as I also mentioned, in quadratic gravity, the status is exactly the same as the one for general relativity. The theory is also proven to be um, well posed. And then now there's, there's a bunch of people, and I'm involved in that, trying to, to put these equations on a computer. And in the third part of the talk, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then now I think we can extend that to fixed order in the EFT. Okay, so um, to understand this more mathematically, I want to um, introduce Lyrae weights and I'll first state um, what, has, what is meant by Lyrae weights and what the diagonalization statement is. Um, and then I'll give an example. So just bear with me here for a second, but the statement is going to be about a set of equations E and a set of um, variables V. And we want to have second order equations and we want to have the same number of equations and the same number of variables. That's just to set up a reasonable partial differential equation scheme. I, I just have, have to inter, in, interrupt yeah. here because you put Cecile DeWitt-Moretz 
on the, up here, and she was yeah. to, to mentioned that she was a postdoc here at Dias. Oh, nice! I didn't know that. I was one of yeah. postdocs. Mm -hmm. I've put that here. That's a textbook, um, or what I mean here is, yes, a, is I... a textbook by the, uh, in my opinion, very very nice um, textbook by Yvonne Chakebua and Cecilia de Moret, where this is nicely explained. So yeah. I think if you want to have a reference of Leroy Wade's, this I think is the best one that I found. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but I. <laughs> No, that's good. So, um, and now I'm labeling these sets of equations with an index i. So you can think of I'm having n variables indexed by i and the associated n partial differential equations also um, indexed by i. And now um, the principal part of these equations, which is just the, the part which has the highest derivatives of the variables appearing, in this case, second order derivatives of the variables appearing, that part can be diagonalized if there exist positive integers, which are then called the Lyrae weights, um, two sets of them, again, n integer numbers, which fulfill certain conditions. And you will see that these conditions basically tell you how you have to diagonalize this or how, what you have to do to diagonalize the system. So these are the formal um, two conditions. One is that for um, the variable of its own equation, which basically defines which equation is the only own variable equation, you want this these two indices to be equal to the derivative order with which the variable contributes to its own evolution equation. And for all other combinations, you want it to be larger than the contribution of some other variable to the evolution equation. As I said, formal definition, it's much more useful to give an example. I'll do so on the next slide. But this gives a prescription to diagonalize the principal part. And whenever that holds, you can do so. So here's a super simple. This was the simplest example that I could think of. Um, you just have two wave equations. But this is not really a wave equation because it has second order derivatives of u on the right hand side as well. So that's why this has not directly a diagonal principal part, but we might imagine that this can be brought into diagonal form. And indeed, the Lyrae weights would tell us, yes, it can, because you can assign this set of integers. So now checking these conditions, the first equation would be this one. And indeed, the 2 minus 0 is 2, which is exactly the same as the order of the equation, second order equation on u. And also for the other equation, 3 minus 1 is 2. So this is, again, the same as the highest derivative appearing on v. And also, these cross terms, 2 minus 1, for the first equation is 1, which is larger than the, contribution, the order with which v contributes to the equations, and vice versa. Um, it's also, it also holds true. 3 minus 0 is 3, which is larger than second order with which u contributes to the v equation lots of um, words. What this means is now I can take, you You want to arrange, the, rearrange the equations such that the S Lyrae weights are the same for both equations. So you have to take another, in this case, time derivative of the, um, of the first set of equations. And if you do that, then indeed you basically introduce a new variable u dot, which is just the time derivative of u, then you can rewrite the first equation as box u dot equals dt of v. And the second equation is box v is dt of u dot, because now I've defined this extra variable u dot. And this is now has a diagonal principal path, right? Because the second order terms are diagonal. These are just first order terms on the right hand side now. And so you've really diagonalized the principal part. That's a, a very simple example. But these, the statement holds true whenever you can find these Lyrae weights. And um, a very nice way, at least I find so, to, to think about this is you just put the Lyrae weights above the equations. And if you think of, of a football score, the home team should always lead by two. And then you can try to search for these integers in such a way that they uh, maintain the structure in larger systems of equations. All right, I hope the use of Lyrae weights is, is somewhat um, clear. All right. So 
let's take a look at general relativity. General relativity is, is kind of special and, and obviously well posed because um, you can introduce a gauge potential, which is really just um, this statement here um, about the contraction of the metric into the Christoffel symbol. And you can pick certain gauges in which this FA is either zero or constant. And I'll get to that in a second. And then the Ricci curvature, you can really fully express by just being a, a wave-like operator on the metric plus terms which are first order covariant derivatives of this gauge potential, and then terms which are first order derivatives of the metric. This will be my notation of um, no derivatives, first order derivatives, and so on. And so in harmonic gauge, which is exactly a gauge in which you pick um, this gauge potential to be zero, then the vacuum Einstein equations, which are RAB equals zero, it's actually also true for the non-vacuum, but these equations are of wave-like form because they are box GAB. And if you put FA to zero, this term vanishes. So there are no second order derivatives of the metric anymore. And these are first order anyways. So then the system is kind of trivially diagonalized. And of course, there's a, there's a big um, extra thing that you have to show for well-posedness, which is the constraint propagation. And I will not talk about this. It's a formal proof, but there's no subtleties in the generalization to the higher derivative theories. So GR in that sense is, is already diagonal without performing further steps. So it's already in wave-like form. Now, um, and this is really um, the great insight by the paper by David Noakes, is that even if you have such a higher derivative theory, if you would now derive the equations of motion just by varying the action, you get a set of equations of motion which have fourth order derivatives of the metric. And indeed, that's also true for any um, addition of curvature scalars here. It will still be fourth order equations. You increase the order of the equations as soon as you introduce extra covariant derivatives. So if you had box terms, then you have six order and so on and so on, equations of motion. But you can take these equations of motion and use the Bianchi identities and everything, and you will always be able to reduce them into a set of um, coupled second order equations. And Noakes has done that um, following actually previous work in perturbative statements of Kelly Stell. And this, first of all, it, pro it produces a larger set of second order equations, which is very useful for us. But also it identifies the both the linear degrees of freedom and the nonlinear. These are also the nonlinear degrees of freedom of the system. So um, this is what the system then qualitatively looks like for this particular theory. You have a box equation of G, which is just really, again, the definition of what you mean by Ricci curvature, where I've now introduced this S, which is the traceless Ricci tensor, and R is the trace. So it's basically splitting the equations into a traceless part and a trace part. And then um, this box equation is just diagonal already. And the higher order equations, the fourth order equations, become split into a trace part and a traceless part. The trace part propagates one degree of freedom. It's a second order equation, so two initial conditions. So one degree of freedom, a spin zero, massive scalar. And the um, traceless part propagates a massive spin two degree of freedom. And indeed, this degree of freedom is ghost-like in a sense that if you um, introduce these as extra variables and rewrite the action, then the kinetic term for these extra variables will have the opposite sign than the kinetic term for the metric. And as I said, I'll return to an explanation why that's not catastrophic, or at least my best understanding of why that's not catastrophic in the very end. But um, definitely you can rewrite the equations in that form and you maintain the same number of initial conditions, right? You have more equations, but they are now second order. They have really the same number of initial conditions, the same number of degrees of freedom as the original equations. I've just order reduced them to second order. 
and um, this system is not immediately um, diagonal, right? Because I now have here these um, extra second order derivatives, which are off diagonal in a sense of mixing um, the index part of this equation and also mixing this equation into this equation. So these are the terms which we have to worry about. And um, so now we can again um, conclude that if you have equal masses, so if this is one, then these terms are going to drop, then this would be of wave-like form. And indeed that will be helpful for the, for the higher order terms. But even without that, you can assign integers of this type again. And these fulfill also the Liray weight conditions. So it tells you that you have to take derivatives of these equations to bring the equations into quasi-diagonal form. And that's what Noakes um, has recognized and used. And so for unequal masses, you can still find these suitable Liray weights. And so the system is still, um, you can still have a quasi-linear diagonal form. So again, it admits for um, second order field equations, which are going to be well posed. Are there uh, questions up to you? I think we're okay for the moment. Okay, just let me say that lots of people um, are now very confused because they, they I've made the statement that there's a ghost in the theory um, and there are this is, in this lots... is well known, though. I mean, Sorry? This is well known from the quantum point of view, so... I think but there is a ghost course. in the theory? Yeah, yeah, sure. Why? I agree. But um, there are... Often people expect that if there's a ghost in the theory, that a continuum field theory has an arbitrarily large um, uh, phase space, and therefore the ghost will lead to instantaneous decay. But well-posedness is kind of exactly the opposite statement, right? So well-posedness tells you that you have, I mean, if I think of decay as something happening in time, it tells me that my solution exists for some amount of time. So it, to me, the statement that this is well-posed is in direct um, contradiction to what people typically expect in continuum, classical continuum field theories to happen with ghosts. Anyway. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that until the the pro potential bonus slides. So for the cubic case, you can now go on. And as I said, these box terms here, they will introduce yet one more layer of additional modes. So we will now have not just one massive scalar and one massive tensor mode, but we will have two massive scalars and two massive tensor modes. Again, you can um, write the system in second order form. This is now a bit of work because you have to use the Bianchi identities in the right way to reduce um, the right-hand side always as far as possible. But it, it, it's fully nonlinear true. And you can write them in a form in which um, these derivatives hold true. So that you only have derivatives up to second order of the respective variables, the wild tensor, the traceless Ricci, and the Ricci. And um, if you do that, you can again see that you can assign um, suitable Liray weights if you pick these, this relation between the masses. So these couplings, this again means that the highest order modes, so in this case, the highest order scalar and massive tensor, they have the same masses. That's the physical statement of this statement. And if so, then just as it did on in the quadratic theory, right? This term vanishes if the masses are the same. The offending, this offending term vanishes again. All right, sorry, this part here vanishes. And if that's the case, then um, you can again get rid of that term and you assign Liray weights and you can again check that these Liray weights lead to a quasi-diagonal um, system. And that's the core of the proof that it works. Um, and you can extend exactly the same method to inductively to yet higher and higher order. So you can even now look at um, K, box to the K operators, and form a larger set of systems um, where you now just have 
k layers of massive particles in between, and then a highest order massive particle for which you have to pick the right combination here between the highest order couplings. And again, you can assign a set of Lie-Ray weights, which will now be a tower that tell you that you have to diagonalize the system in a, in a certain way. And um, all of this is not altered if you add um, lower order terms, lower order in a sense that they will only contribute to these operators here in the action. And these are exactly the, that's true for the cases that I've shown you before of the cubic theory where the, where the field redefinitions have introduced suitable, we call them regularizing terms because they make it possible to have a well-posed evolution. And for the full proof, um, which actually uses slightly different methods and is mainly due to um, my colleague Aaron Kovac, um, this complete proof, you can find it in this publication. But to me, the gist, the physical gist is really this, that you can turn the system into a quasi-linear diagonal form. So. This is really helpful because if I now go back um, to these effective field theories, um, for GR it works, um, for quadratic terms or for quadratic gravity, Noakes has shown that it works, but now we really know that all these layers will also work, um, at least if you trust the field definitions. And so that I think gives us a mathematical basis for for performing um, numerical simulations in these theories. All right, I'll I'll go to the numerics if there are no no questions up to this point. All right, so for the numerics, um, I will stick to quadratic gravity. As you might have noticed, the generalized proof of well posedness is just two months um, <laughs> ago. So so we we haven't put the cubic and quartic corrections on a computer yet. We're actually working on that. Um, but so I will stick to the quadratic corrections. As I said, these can be removed by field redefinitions whenever the global solution stays perturbatively close to GR. And therefore, you can interpret these results um, in different ways. So first of all, you can view them as a, a way of trying to sort of proceed to the cubic and quartic terms, just as a benchmark model of how this works and in particular um, of how to deal with these ghosts because I think the the key remaining question is we've sort of you can achieve well positiveness at the price of these ghost modes and if these ghost modes lead to instantaneous decay well then it, it's not very helpful as I said that's not expected if the system is well posed and indeed at least in this quadratic theory what we will see is that that will not happen and indeed we can find initial data for which there's no instability at all. Um, that's one way of interpreting these results, just as a test for a higher order. You can also interpret them exactly as we discussed um, for situations in which you have no vacuum. While I will only perform black hole simulations here, similar methods should apply also to star-like solutions. Um, and as soon as you do that, you cannot perform the field definitions consistently. Or if you just want to be cautious about the field redefinitions, because somehow you should be able to extract the same physics, then it's sort of a complicated way of doing the nonlinear evolution before the field redefinitions. And then the final interpretation is, well, forget about effective field theory. I really want to treat this theory as a fundamental potential action of gravity. In that case, what you what you what you're saying is that these extra massive modes, you really consider them to be not just an artifact of truncating something at finite order, but you really view them as physical modes of the theory. And if they are physical modes of the theory, they should carry some dynamics. And indeed, we will see that they can cause instabilities and that there's a, there's a lot of interesting physics related to that. And of course, this particular model of gravity, some of you who might be interested in high energy. Um, it's well known since uh, Kelly Stella that this is contrary to GR. It's a renormalizable field theory because the propagators have different high energy falloffs. That's very intimately related to the ghost. So you need the ghost for that. Um, but the theory is actually asymptotically free. 
And recently, there's a paper um, by Roberto Percacci and, and um, Donahue, and probably also Carlos Menenzes, um, where they show that even you can have the whole thing without tachyons. So there's, there's a, there was a lot of debate about whether you will have a tachyonic instability, but it seems like um, there's a corner of parameter space where you can achieve a UV-complete model, um, so really a full a theory of gravity, without a tachyonic instability, you will have a ghost. And that's why I think the, the ghost question is still very important. All right, so in some sense, I think this last interpretation is the most straightforward interpretation of, of the results because any results that I've simulated which are converged apply to this, to this interpretation. In the EFT, you always have to worry about am I in, within the regime of validity or not. All right, so with that, I'll, I'll go to the part three, which is on numerics. I'll convince you that indeed um, the well-posedness of the equations leads to numerically stable evolution so that we really are able to discretize the system and find um, converged results which converge with the expected rate to the continuum solution. Then I'll talk a little bit about isolated black holes and then I'll talk about um, binary waveforms in the end. So let's um, first talk about numerical stability. And here, um, I really want to um, credit my collaborator, Hyun Lim from Los Alamos, who, who is, has spent his whole career in numerical relativity. And without him, I wouldn't have known how to perform these simulations. There's really a huge amount of work in developing the computer code. This is not even, um, he hasn't even developed this computer code. It's a group of people, and he's contributed to that during his PhD. But the whole thing uses um, a bunch of things um, like parallel adaptive mesh refinement, which is exactly this that you see here, that the mesh around the black hole, so if I restart the simulation, around the black hole, the mesh becomes tighter. That's extremely important for numerical efficiency, because otherwise you would have to do that throughout the domain and it would become very inefficient. It has a certain way um, of dealing with these specific cells, which is different from other codes, which makes it very um, largely scalable. Most importantly for what I'm going to say next, it, it uses, or at least we use it with fourth order finite differencing, which means that we discretize all the um, derivatives, the spatial derivatives which occur with um, fourth order precision or fourth order stencils. And then we also use fourth order time evolution, in this case, a runge kutta um, implicit method. And so the fact that these are both fourth order mean that if as we approach the continuum solution, we expect this to converge with fourth order to the continuum result. And that's exactly how you check whether your numerics is well behaved. And indeed, any sort of typo in the equations, any factor of two, will completely screw up this convergence. So it's a very good test. So the first test um, that we performed is really just taking a black hole solution. In this case, it's a Schwarzschild solution, um, picking suitable parameters of the theory um, and introducing some noise, right? The numerics will always introduce all possible noise that you have. And in particular, that, will, that you can understand as being at the level of the noise, arbitrary perturbations of the black hole physically. And so to control that, we introduce physical, so, no, sorry, not physical, but additional noise, which is above the numerical capabilities of, of the resolution. So we just artificially introduce arbitrary noise, and we check that this um, noise does not excite any instabilities. And that indeed is the case. So here, what you see, is um, the Hamiltonian constraint of the theory. So that should be preserved over time. And indeed, you see that it's um, preserved with increasing precision the smaller you dial the noise. And there's nothing that, that grows in that Hamiltonian constraint. Notice also that the time is much, much longer than the light crossing time of the black hole. So we really perform a long simulation here. And now, um, getting back to this, this fourth order of finite differencing. So now you can perform the simulation at different resolutions. 
and you can compare the different resolutions in such a way that you you expect to see the convergence rate of each local point in the simulation and you can average that over all local points and then you find again exactly that convergence factor four so that really tells us that with the discretization if you make the discretization a factor two smaller you converge to a solution exactly at the rate that you would expect and in that sense if we now estimate the error between the highest resolution and the next one we really have a local error estimate which tells us very precisely how close to the continuum field theory we are and that really is why we trust um, to extract continuum physics from that so all of that um, if you're not interested in the numerics is just me making the statement that we are very very sure that we have the numerics under control so now um, let's talk uh, about physics again so um, let me first talk about isolated black holes and there's a little bit of background that i have to uh, talk about which is that in this quadratic theory now taken as a fundamental theory there are there's not just one branch of black holes but there's multiple um, black hole solutions and in fact there's also other solutions of the theory some are naked singularities and it's non-trivial and to some extent non-linearly unexplored which of these branches in which regime of parameter space is stable or unstable so what i show you here is the two black hole branches so what i mean by black hole is an asymptotically flat solution with a horizon um, and this branch here is just schwarzschild right because it has the relation between the radius of the black hole and the mass at asymptotic infinity here rescaled by m2 to just have a two-dimensional plot but the radius mass relation is exactly r black hole equals 2m so it's exactly this is the statement that this is schwarzschild and moving along this line goes through the one parameter family of the schwarzschild solution and then there's this this other branch of solutions which is very non-intuitive in a sense that if you increase the asymptotic mass so if you go in this direction of the plot you decrease the um, local horizon so you make the local horizon more compact and vice versa if you increase the horizon it decreases the asymptotic mass and indeed the branch here continues down to negative masses so as you make the black hole very large it has negative asymptotic mass so this is a really funky solution and i think it's due to the fact that you have a ghost in this theory let me just also comment on the effective field theory regime this would really be controlling the curvature scales of your theory so the perturbative closeness to gr really breaks down at this point so the eft is valid all the way up here um, and then it's unclear if it's valid at this transition point it might be valid sort of around it because that at least in this um, stationary picture is perturbatively close it's certainly not valid somewhere down here and somewhere up here even less and here is interesting because you might have a different effective field theory here and i think this is the effective field theory where you also take into account the other massive modes as low energy degrees of freedom so that's just a comment on the regime of validity of the EFT. And you will see that that somehow is mirrored in the stability properties of the black hole. So what has been known, um, also due to Kelly Stell, which I should have put as a reference here, um, and Vitor Cardoso and collaborators, is the stability of the Schwarzschild branch. Because what you have to do there is you really just take the massive modes as linear perturbations so it's linear perturbation modes around a Schwarzschild black hole which is a rather straightforward calculation and so we know that there is um, a stable part of the Schwarzschild branch and an unstable part of the Schwarzschild branch and um, you can understand this instability in the form of um, quasi normal mode type in this case bound state perturbations which have the unstable sign so if I, these perturbations behave like e to the minus i think i omega so if um 
the imaginary part of omega is negative, you will have a, sorry, e to the i omega. So if the imaginary part of omega is negative, then you will have a decaying solution. This is the stable branch here. And if you find a mode which has a positive imaginary part, that signals a linear instability. And so that's exactly what, um, what we have repeated here. This result was known before. And so there's this branch point of solutions. And above the branch point, the Schwarzschild black hole is stable. And below, it suffers from an instability due to long wavelength modes. So this really is the longest possible wavelength perturbation that you can fit into the black hole. So I'm calling this uh, Gregory Laflamme instability. And that might ring a bell to some of you who have been involved with um, higher dimensional black holes, so, or black strings, because indeed that's where um, Ruth Gregory and Laflamme, they um, discovered an instability of a string-like solution in higher dimensions, which also fits a massive mode onto the string. And so I'm calling this a Gregory Laflamme instability because the linear perturbation equations are actually exactly the same. Because you're somehow you know, you're compactify if you compactify the string, you really also just get um, perturbations of a massive spin two mode on top of the black hole or string um, background. That leads to the fact that the linearized dynamics is exactly equivalent in the two sim in, in the two situations. And there's been a lot of interest in the in higher dimensional black holes. So this Gregory Laflamme instability is very well understood. There's even rigorous math proofs of the stability, at least in certain regimes. Okay, that all said, I think it's interesting, but the nonlinear dynamics will be totally different from the higher dimensional case. So what we've done is we've extended this to the other branch of solutions. And what we find is that again, the large black holes are stable and the small black holes are unstable. So this tells us that overall in this theory, Black holes seem to be stable if they are sufficiently large and unstable if they are small. All right. Small and large with respect to this mass scale of the spin two mode. So um, we wanted to see that in the full three plus one uh, nonlinear evolution. And indeed, we can find exactly that instability rate. So the red line here is a simulation which should be somewhere around this point at zero point. Actually, yeah, I'm saying this somewhere here, 0 0.2, but there's a factor of two involved. So it's a 0 0.4, it's around this point. The instability is strong. And on both sides, the instability gets weaker and weaker and weaker. Now, on the one side, it just scales to something which takes infinitely long to grow, but is still unstable. And on the other side, eventually, the instability really turns off. All right, so that we can recover. And now the interesting thing is to think of the nonlinear evolution of that linear instability. And what's very nice is that by now we have uh, two completely independent setups. So this um, work here by Will East and Neil Simonson uses completely different methods. It works in a different gauge. It works in an axially symmetric code. So we haven't talked to each other at all, and indeed we find um, the same results, which is a super nice um, consistency check, and I was, I was very happy with that, because before I was always thinking we got some, some terms in the equations wrong. Um, so what you see here is, again, the linear instability, which is this regime here, or equivalently these regimes. And then what I'm plotting is the um, mass where the local mass of the black hole or equivalently the apparent horizon versus time where this m is the initial mass of the system and um, so what you see is that the local mass grows so indeed these are transitions between the two branches of solutions they happen from the from the schwarzschild branch to the other branch of solutions and these transitions are basically sort of the black hole growing into the other branch of solutions. Just for clarity, the nonlinear evolution that you are following here, is it the full C squared plus R squared? Yes. Plus R. So you're following that full um, higher order gravity theory? Yes. Okay. 
that so in in our simulations we are really the equations that i showed you before the the second order system of equations we reduce that to first order in time but it really propagates all the degrees of freedom of the theory yes and just i still want to be clear because uh, are you are you truncating this a truncating in what sense in derivatives no. No, no, no. So if you you're take your, uh, so you, you are you are just taking those equations and solving them. You're using your methods, the full second, the full system of equations. Precisely. All of yes. the nonlinearities. Okay. Yes. Good. Right. Yes. Yes. So as I said, I think what or my interpretation of this is that it. So I'm saying my interpretation because we haven't yet confirmed that this black hole has actually the same properties as this black hole, but this it's very reasonable to expect so for sure this black hole is not a Schwarzschild black hole and it looks as if it transitions from a Schwarzschild black hole somewhere into this other regime where the at least the linear perturbations tell us that this is a stable branch of solutions again and here it really looks as if the nonlinear solutions are stable as well so this to me really tells me that at least in this specific set of initial conditions and at least for this time there is no instability that I can see. I mean, there's the onset of a local instability, but it leads to a new branch of solutions. Just uh, with regard to the higher uh, derivative system, um, I know that the, uh, the sol solutions of vacuum Einstein are all solutions to it, but then, but there are other mm -hmm. solutions. Is there a, another axially symmetric solution which is not Schwarzschild to that. System. Yeah, so, so we expect there to be an axially symmetric generalization of this branch as well. At least for low spin, people have obtained it in expansions. Um, no exact but solution the, is known. But for sure, there's no analytical solution known. Mm -hmm. okay. I think there are some no, no, not even a full nonlinear um, solution, except for like if I would take the spatial slice here, it would be the nonlinear solution. Um, but no, there's no analytical solution. And the reason is that uh, the the whole sort of separability structure that you have in in general relativity, right? It's a Petrov type D solution. So deriving the Kerr solution is very non-trivial in general relativity. And this doesn't work anymore for a quadratic. Yeah, but but I, well, presumably, you're not dealing with a rotating case. That I, I can just deal with full spherically symmetric setting. Ah, so in in spherical symmetry, uh, this branch of solutions has an at least numerical solution. There's again no analytic solution, but there at least is a numerical solution. And there is no known uh, spherically symmetric. It doesn't seem like such a difficult system of equations in that setting to me, but uh, if you, so it, 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 I mean, you have to solve fourth order equations. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it, it would be amazing to have an analytical solution because then, I mean, part of the difficulty of this, um, these analytic perturbations here that I've shown you to produce these, um, this part of the branch is that you have to perform numerics to find the quasi normal modes on top of a numerical background. So numerics on top of numerics is always tricky. So really, we are only sure about stability in the vicinity of, of this point. Um, so having an analytical solution would be very nice also for setting up initial data. So if, if you have an idea of how to solve these equations, it would be, would be really very cool. <laughs> I, I haven't um, found a way to do it now, for now. Um, Okay, so, so one thing you also mentioned, which is very important for the next um, part, is that any Ricci flat solution, so really any even complicated um, solution of general relativity, will be a solution to that theory. It's just the question of whether it's a stable solution or an unstable solution. And that helps us in the sense of that we can, we can easily set up initial data um, for a binary black hole, or easily in the sense of as easily as GR, because we can just take the GR initial data. Okay, so let's get um, to binary black holes. I think also I'm already over the hour. Um, so I'm going to talk about three different regimes. 
So first of all, a regime in which the masses, and in particular the spin two mass, so you notice that I haven't mentioned the spin zero mass at all, that's because for all this instability question, you can just completely forget about it. But the um, masses are heavy in a sense of that they are larger than one in these particular units. You can think of the Compton wavelength being larger than the radius of the black hole. Um, then I will talk about a regime where this is sort of on this branch point, um, where we would expect some quantitative deviations. And then here, um, you really expect completely different, qualitatively different physics, something like these transitions in the black holes. And this is related, as I said before, to the EFT regime of validity. Here, clearly, the EFT should be valid. Here, it's kind of, well, it's on the verge of validity. And here, it should probably not hold anymore. So we should only take this fundamental interpretation. So um, this is the regime. So I'm going to first talk about the regime where the EFT is obviously valid, so where the masses are large. And indeed, what I'm showing you here is a full binary merger all the way from in spiral to merger. And I'm showing you the, the track of the position of the, uh, of the center of mass, uh, sorry, of one of the black holes. And you can see that the whole system in spirals in and eventually merges. And I'm showing both general relativity and quadratic gravity. And you see that the solutions lie exactly on top of each other. And indeed, if you would take this numerical noise analysis and you would subtract one from the other, we actually see that up to numerical noise, the solutions are exactly the same. Even though in the, in the second case, we propagate the full system. So what this tells us, and I really think this is a really crucial result for the validity of, of quadratic gravity as a fundamental theory, it tells us that even in the strong field regime of a merger, if you make the masses of the additional field sufficiently heavy, and in particular, if you expect them to come from a quantum gravity perspective, you would expect them to be of Planckian size, so way heavier than the, um, than the associated masses which lead to an instability. Um, then this theory is, just has the same dynamics as GR. It perfectly mimics general relativity in that sense. And so I think this is really important for the, for the fundamental um, interpretation. So we, ex we haven't performed any other merger in this regime, but we expect this to hold, like because this is completely nonlinear, we expect it to hold in any other nonlinear situation as well. It's also promising for the whole um, question of ghosts in these evolution equations, because it's exactly the regime where we made the ghosts heavy and so there's no 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 Ostrogratsky type instabilities in this regime. Now let's um, sort of go in the more dangerous um, direction. Here now I'm simulating sort of at the branch point. So 0 0.43 in this unit is exactly at the branch point of the two solutions, and I will pick 0 0.4, which is sort of slightly below. So the instability should set on during the simulation. And um, so what we do is we take still GR initial data, we wait for a while so that during the in spiral, the two black holes have grown into the new solutions. And once they reach the stable solutions, I will show you the rest of the waveform. And that um, looks something like that. So you see that indeed there are some modifications in the late time um, evolution at merger. And again, we can fully simulate the full theory through merger um, yeah, and so now we are still waiting for simulations to come in um, for the fully um, beyond GR regime, where you really have a fast transition to the new black hole solution. Um, and then we expect the quantitative deviations to become really qualitative, and yeah, hopefully these results will, will soon be out. But with that, um, I think, to me at least, there's now a feasible pathway to obtain at the same level of rigor than in general relativity, strong field prediction for such modified theories of gravity. And that's of course interesting for gravitational waves, but I also think it's interesting in a bunch of other um, fields of physics. So for instance, think about cosmology and the production of primordial black holes, all these type of 
everywhere where really nonlinear phenomena matter, I think these numerical solutions or these numerical ways of solving the equations can be of, of great um, use. And of course, um, the systems that we propagate all have ghosts. So I don't know if I can take five more minutes, then I can quickly talk about the ghosts. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I will take sort of the, the, a simplistic view and talk about point particles again. And the reason to do so is that really the only hard argument that we have against ghosts to my understanding, comes from point particle systems. And that's really the Ostrogratsky theorem itself, which states that if you have a higher derivative theory, it doesn't state something as generic as, as what people usually say. So it doesn't state something like all higher derivatives are unstable. There's, there's no such claim. It's a statement about point particles, classical point particles, a statement about non-degeneracy, which is not so important for what I'm going to say, and it's a statement um, actually not even about runaway solutions. So it doesn't state that there are runaway solutions. It's a statement about the Hamiltonian. It's a statement that the Hamiltonian of such theories, if it's defined in the way that Ostrogatsky does, um, is unbounded both from above and below. And this really, the left-hand side, is the real theorem. It's no statement on field theory. It's no statement on quantization. And it's not even a statement about stability, it's just a statement about the Hamiltonian. And the, everything else that is inferred from that, to my understanding of, of what's out there in the literature, is in some sense physical extrapolation of this, of this hard fact. And of course, there are reasons to expect that, because you can write down classical point particle systems, which do then immediately lead to that runaway, and you can study that runaway. But indeed, even the extrapolation from here to unbounded Hamiltonians to runaways is not completely true. There was a very nice paper by Cédric Desfayers and collaborator. Cédric Desfayers is now um, is here in Paris. That's uh, part of the reason why I'm here in Paris. Um, they've written a paper in 2022 where they really write down a, an example of a point particle system where they can prove that there is no runaway. And we've generalized these results. And to me, the fact that even the point particle system, you can find a counterexample, makes me very cautious in um, all the rest of the understanding that has been claimed out there in the literature. Um, and in some sense, the simulations that I've shown you also tell you that there is nothing instantaneous about a decay happening in these, in these field theories. So that fits very well together, and we are currently trying to understand that better. But here's the simple model. So the key to proving things is integrability. So an extra constant of motion, and therefore you have to have a certain type of equations, and there's a so-called Liouville class of these models, and we understand a bunch of these things. We actually have hard criteria. I'm not going to um, delve into that. There are um, polynomial subclasses and I can show you one of them. So for instance, this theory is really a polynomial point particle theory. It doesn't look in any way special. It has some mass terms and some quartic couplings and some sextic couplings. Um, and it, you can prove that the global motion, irrespective of the initial conditions, remains in a finite phase space volume. Basically, the size of the phase space volume is set by your initial conditions, just like in a, in a theory without ghosts. And um, so this subclass, for instance, here, you see exactly that motion. If, you're, if you'd like to see a plot instead of a, a proof, um, these are the two point particle positions. And just as well, the point particle momenta, I put the initial conditions, and then I evolve the system, and you get these so-called Lissajou figures which exactly tell you that eventually the motion sort of closes. That's the integrability property, and then it remains in a finite phase space volume. So um, the integrability... Is yeah? the system unitary, and is, it, is the evolution unitary? Because that's also another thing that's often drawn in. Well, unitary, you probably mean in a, in a if I would have quantized the system. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I do not know. I have not attempted to quantize the system yet. But... It, it would be very interesting to know. So for now, this is a classical statement. Yeah. 
Um, but so, yeah, let, let me get to that in a second. Um, so the numerics um, suggest that this integrability is crucial for our proof, but it, it's not necessary. So I've performed um, in similar models. We understand some physical conditions that you have to apply. And I've performed numerical simulations and for very, very long time, they remain also in a finite phase space volume. So uh, I have no proof that without integrability, it will still be stable. And it's indeed a question of whether without integrability, with integrability, you know that if you're at one phase space point out here, um, whenever you return to the same phase space point, you must be on the same solution, or even a neighboring point must be close to that. Without integrability, it could happen that sort of whenever the solution transits through a local region where it interacts, it extracts a little bit of energy and then slowly that energy um, leads to a runaway. I cannot formally exclude that at this point. Um, we are currently working on understanding the relation to field theory and that's basically working in simple um, toy models of field theories which sort of make us understand local well posedness is very obvious if you write them down but you would like to now understand when there is an instability and when not clearly it's not catastrophic as far as that's one thing i can say for sure and i hope that um, we will be able to put out results soon as i said the quantization we haven't explored yet so i don't have an answer to your unitarity question but um, the way that in quantum field theory you would think about unitarity you have a choice when you quantize your system to accept either um, negative norm states or negative um, um, or a violation of unitarity and the negative norm states are typically ruled out because even the, you expect due to the Ostrogratsky problem even the classical theory to not be stable now if the classical theory can somehow be stable you might want to pick the, this branch of solutions and then unitarity is not a, not the issue the question is then whether the quantized theory will be stable but again i think there's there's lots of um, interesting things to be explored to me these theories are worth studying both from a fundamental perspective because i don't buy the um, arguments against them anymore and from the perspective of just making the effective field theory work having the ghosts under control. And with that, yeah, thank you. Thank you for a wonderfully presented talk. Thank you. Any... Yeah, thanks for the questions. I have a question. Too. Yeah, please you speak yeah. up. Werner Nam is here. Yeah. With me, so, uh, so uh, in the isolated black hole uh, case, uh, when you are on the non-GR branch, if yes. you take a good image, uh, would you see the difference? You mean take an optical image? Yes. Well, that really depends on the parameters that I choose. So if I take the quantum gravity hat on and I expect that this um, M2 scale is of the Planck mass scale, then all these perturbations will be suppressed by ratios of M Planck over M of the, of the mass of the black hole. So I would not see any deviations. They would be tiny. And so I would be in, clearly I would be in, whoops, um, this regime where the solutions are stable against GR. So if I would now be, in, even if I would be in the other branch, the deviations would be tiny to GR. Um, now, if you go to a regime which is not, um, where you don't expect this mass to be related to the Planck mass, and that's a question of naturalness. But like, if you don't expect naturalness to happen, and if you assume that this quadratic gravity theory as a fundamental theory is healthy, then maybe this M2 is larger. And if it's of astrophysical um, size, then yes, you can have deviations, which clearly will look different. I think whenever the merger will look different. So whenever the merger will look something like this, you would also expect some deviations in in the in the in, in other observations of the strong field regime. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Can I? Yeah, um, sure. Well, I was wondering. Uh, so if you if you test instead the quadratic theory, for instance, um, 
in a different re regime like the lens steering. So usually there is also, I mean, uh, general relativity has been tested in many different ways, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's say rotating mass and, you know, um, actually, of course, uh, we know that quadratic gravity gives some correction to the Newtonian potential or eventually mm -hmm. also the local effect. I mean, uh, although it seems that uh, uh, the, the quadratic theory looks very nice in agreement with the gravitational waves, is there any way to, um, you know, understand if it's also in agreement with other kind of uh, measurements, like, uh, as I said, lens steering has been measured for the Earth and with a quite nice mm -hmm. approximation. And black yeah. holes also can give rise to lens steering, very strong lens steering effect. Is there any way to, I mean, to have a comparison with other kind of uh, system, not only gravitational waves? Mm -hmm. So the, to me, this falls under the um, the name of weak field tests of general relativity, mm -hmm. or in this case, um, quadratic gravity, where um, I think all of these tests, correct me if I'm wrong, can be approximated by a stationary solution and post-Newtonian corrections around that yeah. stationary yeah. solution. Yeah. Um, and this, there are constraints on the couplings of these theory of this theory from there, um, but they are very, very weak in a sense of that they that they are weaker than. So this waveform would not be constrained by right. these constraints. I see because it's too weak. Uh, but on the other hand, I guess in a in a very uh, heavy black hole, maybe there would be some. Uh... That is correct. So so sorry, this waveform. If the mass of the black holes is of solar mass scale, is yeah. not constrained. If I oh. pick the mass being supermassive, okay. then I'm actually not sure. Probably then there is a statement of a constraint um, that would be relevant. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the other question is uh, so, in principle, I mean, uh, you mentioned uh, Stelle. And uh, so, actually, I remember another work by Stelle and West where they studied first order theory of gravity. This was a called McDowell Mansuri theory. I mean, in principle, one can use instead than, uh, you know, Jim uh, you know, tetrads and uh, spin connection, mm -hmm. study all the theory of gravity. And uh, do, do you think that is, I mean, uh, I mean, it's more like, let's say, gauge gravity uh, oriented, uh, this kind mm -hmm. of first order approach. Uh, so in order to get uh, maybe some insight about, you know, any possible connection with the fundamental quantum theories, do you think it uh, would be useful maybe to think, uh, you know, to test uh, let's say numerically, also the first order formalism and the possible extension. Uh, so I think in general, it's good to have different um, formulations for nonlinear evolution. And indeed, I think there is related to um, implementing hydrodynamics in mm -hmm. general relativity. Right. There is a formulation for evolving both uh, then hydrodynamics variables and um, the GR variables which makes use of the spin connection and first order variables. Um, I have not explored it um, in this in the relation to higher derivative theories, but yeah, that, that might be an interesting direction as well. Also, because just a final comment, I mean, uh, uh, in this formally, you can easily introduce a torsion. And I mean, you know, this yes. torsion also something compatible with the Lorentz symmetry and all the other things that you mentioned at the beginning. So you're right. And indeed, I should have said, well, in some sense, it's captured by only the metric being a degree of freedom. Well, but yeah, yeah I, I'm not I, I haven't considered any torsion okay. By okay. deviations. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? We, if not, we can thank uh, Aaron again for a uh, beautifully presented, at least from my point of view, uh, uh, seminar. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for the invitation and uh, lots of Thanks. questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll unshare. I will stop the recording.